Hey, this is Dan Lehman from AutomationHelpers.com, and today we're going to talk about Airtable Forms. Everything you need to know from very beginners, so if you've never used Airtable Forms before, all the way up to some really advanced concepts like how do we update records, how do we split and create multiple records from a single form event, how do we do prefills and conditional logic. We're going to have everything in this video. So we'll start really simple, and we'll progress a little bit along. And I think even if you're a beginner, this is going to give you a good idea of what can and can't be done with Airtable forms. So let's dig in. So we're gonna start things off by creating a new base. I've got this one titled Campus Events, where our goal in this is to capture registration information for homecoming. So that's this use case. Of course, you can capture any kind of information that you want. Just think about it as we're trying to capture a single kind of information with a single form, because it's going to come into this table and we want all of this information to be the same. Most people I know are actually more comfortable in this grid view, which is what Airtable defaults to. Rather than adding a form right from the get-go, we're gonna actually start from the grid. Now, of course, you could start directly on a form and, and create fields, and that's just fine as well. But I think just for our broader audience, it's probably easier if we start with the grid view. I'm just adding a few fields here. I've got a first name field, single line of text, last name, which is a single line of text. I added a participant type. In this case, I've created a multi-select, probably would work as a single select as well. And so with that, I've got a handful of options to choose from. Am I a parent, a student, an alum, a faculty? And again, you can configure this how you want, but we're just going with this use case of capturing registration information. And then from here, I need their email address because we wanna be able to follow up with them after they've registered for an event. I've got graduation year, which is just an integer, and I've got our checkbox field here of whether they're attending a special anniversary dinner, which we'll get to in a little bit as well. You'll notice the one field on here that's a little bit different is our primary field. And in this case, I was thinking, you know, if we were at a large university, probably there are some registrants that might have the same name. So there's two John Johnsons. Well, we don't want it just to be their name field. So I changed this to a formula field. And when I edit this, I'm concatenating or combining the first name followed by their last name. I've got a pipe in here, and then I've got their email address. Now, I will say that all of the uh, code or formulas that you see here are going to be uh, in a link down below. I think you'll find it easier to copy and paste some of these things as you go, rather than having to press pause and type everything down. We'll share that down in the description below this just makes it a little bit easier. So now we've got the participant's name and email address. What that means when we get over to the form view here, let's actually create that form view. You can do that down below by pressing the plus button next to form. I've already got one created. I just titled mine homecoming registration. And from here, you'll notice that it's pulling those fields that we have into the form already. But if we look, we're missing that participant field. And the reason that is, is because any kind of calculated fields, dependent fields, in this case, all we're doing is concatenating their first name, their last name, and their email. Because of that, that's nothing that we can actually just click and change that data. It's being calculated by other dependent fields, other fields that it's dependent on. And so by doing that, we're not going to have access to that field here. Instead, they'll input their first name, last name, email, and it's going to combine that all for us on the back end. If we take a look at the fields, we might decide, mm, you know, I don't want a certain field on here. What if I wanted to remove participant type? I could drag that and just remove it, but I'm actually going to leave this back on here. So I still have my participant type. We also have the option if we wanted to get rid of a field, you could click that field click this little icon, and that's just going to pull it off of the form automatically. So whether you prefer drag and drop or clicking that icon just to make it easy. Now, oftentimes, both for accessibility purposes and, and just to have it make a little bit more sense for the user with forms, you might want to add some help text. Now, a first name's probably pretty obvious, but we could say, you know, enter your first name here. And this is actually going to show for us when we display on the front end. So I can take a look at what it looks like to the end user who's filling it out by pressing this open form button. And you'll notice there I can see the label for this as well. And this is how it's currently rendering to the screen. 
Now, as we make changes, we can just go ahead and refresh this to see how that looks different to the end user. Now, at this point, I probably want to make some of these fields required. That is that the user or the, the end person who's submitting the form data doesn't have the ability to actually submit it until that field is filled out. So in this case, if they filled this out and just put their name and no email address, we'd never be able to contact them with the updates about the event. I'm going to click into that field and say that this is a required field, which is now noted by that asterisk there. So again, if we refresh it on the front end, we'll see that asterisk. And if we tried to submit this without filling out this field, it's going to yell at us politely, of course, to be able to fill in that information. Now you'll notice we have our multi-select here. And this is kind of a, a special field. If it's a single select or multi-select, it can render it two different ways. Right now, I have it showing as a list, which is kind of my preferred way of doing it because we can see all of the options that are available to us. But you can also render it as a dropdown. So if I do it as a dropdown and I refresh my page again, you'll notice that that changes. So instead of rendering all those options, now I select an option and it's going to show it here on the front end this way. Again, I typically prefer rendering it as a list, but that's just your personal preference. The other thing I can do is I can limit these options. So pretend that we're registering for homecoming right now. And for homecoming, we're welcoming parents back to the campus. But maybe we have a different kind of event where it's only students and alum and parents are not invited to this event. Well, if that's the case, we could limit specific options and we could say, hey, we want to make this for students, we want to make it for alum and for faculty, but not for parents. And so that gives us some ability to restrict that without actually changing kind of the field type and the data behind it. So that's a convenient feature. We're pretty well set here. I'm going to talk about conditional logic in just a moment. But I will say you might want to adjust some of the branding elements to personalize it, make it feel a little bit more like the purpose that this form is for. Now, under the free plan, we're not going to have some of the options for branding. But when you move up to some of the upgraded plans, you've got some branding options here. So we'd be able to add a cover image. And I'm going to select, let's see, we'll put this homecoming field. One thing I will say about the background image that it goes here is that it crops it and changes the display based on mobile, based on um, essentially the, the size that can be rendered at one point. So it's not good to have probably text or something that displays only a certain way because it's going to change it depending on the screen size that it's rendering on. So I like to choose something that's abstract or large, gives a good flavor to it, but isn't something that has to display at a perfect size. I'll upload my football field here for homecoming registration. Looks pretty good. And then I'm going to input a logo or something. I've got a homecoming 2022. We'll upload this image. So that's starting to look a little bit nicer. Can refresh this. Now, I, I will say that Airtable is fairly restrictive in terms of the amount of customization, in terms of the branding and the look and feel. Like if we wanted to display these fields and make them narrower or wider, or if we want to have other branding elements, or I want to change the color of the background, you can't really do that within Airtable forms. In fact, even those of you who are familiar with CSS, you really can't override the CSS very well on this. Just be aware that if you're looking for a very tailored solution for your forms, you're going to be looking at a third-party solution. But Airtable does offer a couple options for how we want that branded and to appear. Down below, we've got some additional options. So one is that we could collect a respondent email address. If we weren't doing this registration form, maybe we were doing some product order inventory type form, and we wanted to have users at our company filling out that form. If those users are signed in and users of Airtable, we can capture their email address automatically behind the scenes. So that's a newer option that's available. We can have people essentially get an update of their responses sent to them over their email. Again, we're opting out of Airtable branding, which is a paid feature, but that takes the Airtable logo off of the bottom. We've got an option here to redirect to a URL after the form is submitted. This is really helpful if you're doing any kind of uh, tracking, especially with goals. So if you've got something with Google Analytics or you're doing ad tracking and you want to have essentially a submission event and track and have a, a tracking pixel in there, you could have it redirect to a URL. So I could say, here's my website. 
and send it to a thank you page, have a tracking pixel, and then we'd be able to track that conversion. Or you could just have it from a user experience. We want them redirected somewhere after the fact. But no worries if you don't have that redirect, that's totally fine. You can display just a message. Thank you for submitting the form so that they're not confused. Wait, did my form actually submit or not? You might want to have instances where people can submit another response, probably not in this registration form, but for other kinds of things, if people are submitting work orders, maybe they want to submit another work order. So you give them that option. It can reload after five seconds and we can get an automated response to send it to our email address when they fill out the form. So that's kind of handy in terms of a submission event. We'll also talk about how we can use automations to do other things like connect to Slack and get notifications that way if we choose to do so. I now have my form all set up and ready to go. Let's make sure I've got the latest copy here. And so I can start entering my information. But here's where I want to start talking about conditional logic, because this is what keeps the form interesting and relevant. And what I mean relevant is essentially we want to have the fewest mouse clicks for a user. If we add, you know, 50 fields to this form, that doesn't make it very helpful to a person who's filling it out. They might just get disgusted with it, stop filling it out, and we'll never get them to register for our event. But in this case, at our hypothetical homecoming event, we've got a special dinner that we want to make available. And so I've got some conditional logic baked in here to say, if they are an alum, that's the first thing we want to know. We're going to create this conditional field here. So I've got that graduation year. Again, I set that up back on the grid view, but there's no logic associated with it at that point. It's just this field of information. So I only care about graduation if they are an alum, because if they're just a parent, they might not have gone to this university. If they're a student, they haven't graduated yet. If they're faculty, they could have graduated from here, but they'd also be an alum. So in this case, we're putting in conditional logic to be able to say, if that participant type has any of, and then we're putting in the alum value. You can add multiple conditions here. I'm just keeping it simple. If they're an alum, then we're going to show this next field of graduation year. And let's just check that out. If I press alum, now we have a new field for graduation year. Welcome back to campus. What year did you graduate? Awesome. So we have a special 20 year anniversary dinner. We don't wanna make that available to people who graduated five years ago. We just want that for people who graduated 20 years ago. Now at this point, if they said, oh yes, well, I graduated back. I'm using my old person voice and 2002 is not that long ago. Uh, but if I fill in 2002, again, we get a, another option here. And so this conditional logic now says, if that graduation year equals 2002, then we're going to display this other option. We can say, yes, I would like to come to this dinner. And again, we only make that available. If, if they changed their mind and, and we actually put in 2005, that field would disappear. If we said, I'm no longer an alum and I'm just a parent, again, that's going to disappear as well. This is just important to know that we can use conditional logic here to help kind of that branching logic capture what's most important for this form. Now let's talk about building our first automation for this. And I'm gonna hop back over and so we still have our form here. I'm gonna click on the automations tab and we're gonna keep this really simple. We just want to send ourselves a notification on Slack because our university is using Slack. We've got lots of videos about lots of different kinds of automation. So I encourage you to check those out if you want to learn about other automations, but we're gonna keep this simple for now. And the biggest thing to know is that there is a special trigger just for when a form is submitted. So most of the time we're saying when a record's created, when it's updated, when it meets this conditional logic, but we have a specific trigger based off of that form submission event, which is most commonly what we're going to use if we're building an automation around forms. But when we select that, we have to tell it which table, in this case, it's the, our responses table, and which form. So we can't scope this into different tables across different bases and things like that. We have to tell it which table it's for and which form it's for. And then we're going to create an action. And this action is going to, I just called it event registration alert. I'm choosing the action type. Again, we have lots of different actions. 
the higher upgraded plans come with more integrations that are available to it. So you can get a feel for which integrations we have available to us, but we're choosing Slack in this case to send a message. When we set it up for the first time, if you select Slack account or connect a new Slack account, that's gonna give you the option to put in your credential for Slack to make sure that it's got the right permissions and everything it needs. But once we have it, we can just select our Slack account. I'm telling it that I want it to go to my general channel, but we can send it to a custom event registration channel if we wanted to. And then here's where it gets kind of fun. We can put in a message here. So I'm saying, hooray. And then we can add in the fields that we want here. And you can do that essentially by anytime you want to press this plus button and you can choose the fields that we already have to make that available. So I did this already. I put in, hooray, first name, last name, just registered to attend homecoming. And then what I've done here is that I'm also putting a link to the Airtable record URL. And I don't want it to be this super long, ugly link. Uh, I was able to use my brackets here and then put in event registration. So it should look pretty, but this will give me the opportunity that if we want to actually dig in, maybe we recognize a name on that list and we want to open up the registration record, that'll take us back into Airtable. We can give the bot a name. So event registration is what I called it. And then you can give it a bot icon. You can just Google this for Slack icons, but it uses this colon and then a little description and another colon at the end to be able to identify it. This is a little celebration icon. I'm going to go ahead and enter information in my form. So I'll say Dan Lehman, and I'll put in my email address here. If we don't really care about the conditional logic really at this point, I'll just say that I am a student. No, whatever, I'll, I'll say alum. I'll attend my fancy dinner here. Let me go ahead and submit this. Thank you for submitting the form. If I open up Slack, hey, we'll notice we get it. Event registration has that icon that we talked about. Hooray, Dan Lehman just registered to attend homecoming. And I'd be able to click on the event registration link. And this is going to open up the record now, the submission record. And maybe we captured a whole bunch of other fields. It'd be really helpful to see what else we know about this event registration. And we have all that information here. Hopefully this helps. This is covering really the basics of forms, how to create the forms, how to add conditional logic to forms, and now how we can actually have some automations running on the submission logic as well. So that's what I'd consider kind of the more basic side of Airtable forms. Next, we wanna get into how we can actually pre-fill forms. So how can you send information behind the scenes so that it's already filled out in the form and it doesn't rely on the user to fill out everything themselves. To do that, I've got a different example, this pre-fills example. Now, this is where we're going to start to have more of that formula logic on the back end. So it might be helpful to check it out on the blog article that we've written about it, again, in the description below. For this example, I just need this single table, basically the form submission itself. And in it, I've done very similar to last time. We're not sticking with the homecoming example. We're just treating it as a contact form on a website. I'm capturing first name, last name, email address, phone, and then I'm also capturing their product interest. This is a single select drop-down field. These are just different software packages. Again, it can be whatever is most relevant to your business, but I've got CRM, ERP, or marketing automation platform solutions. If I take a look at the contact form, let me open up this form. When I have my contact form, again, we see that all available on the front end. Nothing very fancy, didn't even add branding to this, but we're gonna show how we can pre-fill the information that we want. So if I go back to a grid view, let's say in this case that we wanted to indicate product interests and we wanted to send that to the form automatically. So when the user opens up this form, now it's automatically going to say, oh, they're interested in CRM. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. And I built a formula just to help construct this link for us. That's the only reason I have this field here in the table. You don't actually have to keep it here. You could construct it in Google Docs if you wanted to, but it makes it a little bit easier here for us. I'm going to go ahead and open up this formula field. I'm going to press edit, and I'm going to drag this down a little bit just to make it easier to see. What we're doing 
is first we have to say, here's the form. And then we have to say, here's the information and here's the field that we want to be able to send it to. So those are the concepts that we're looking at here. So in order to identify the form, we've already opened up that form and every form has a unique identifier associated with it. In this case, it's Airtable.com slash all this random combination of letters here. Now, when you're doing this, you're going to get your own ID. So if you're following along behind the scenes and you're creating this as well, your form ID is going to be different than the form ID that I have. So make sure that you're using the one relevant to you rather than trying to copy and paste it from somewhere else. So that's the first thing I do is I, I copy the entire URL here. I can do uh, control or command C. And I'm going back into my formula field and I'm just pasting it there. And I need to put that in quotes because it's treating it as a, a string or a combination of, of letters and numbers there. And then what I need to do is I need to add a question mark because what happens is anytime that we send information, it adds what we call query parameters or URL parameters behind it. And we need to indicate the start of that by adding a question mark. So make sure to add this. Again, you can copy and paste this from the description you'll find in the blog article. And then what we're doing is we need to tell it which field we want to pre-fill. Airtable makes this pretty easy for us by just adding the words pre-fill and an underscore before the name of the field. So in this case, we want to pre-fill the product field. So if I were to open this, I, I just wanna show you what this looks like. This is the URL that I'm constructing. So remember at the beginning, we had the airtable.com slash the ID of the form. And then we've got that question mark, which is really important. It's gonna totally mess up if you don't have that question mark. And then we're saying prefill underscore, and the name of the field we want is product. And then we wanna tell it the value. So we have to set it equal to, and the value is CRM in this case. So CRM is what we want to tell it. So in order to construct it, let me head back over to my formula field. In order to construct it, we're saying anytime we have the ampersand, the and, that's essentially concatenating it. We've got our URL and the question mark. And let's connect that to prefill underscore. Again, this is a string, so we've got that in those quotes there. And now we could just say product, but here's the problem. What if we called this field product space ID. If we have spaces in anything, it screws up the URL encoding because in order to do it, anything that you have punctuation, you can't just have a kind of the, the normal formatting inside of the URL. So Airtable has a function called encode URL component that says, hey, if we pass it a name and it's got spaces, it's got punctuation in it, we're going to automatically beep boop beep boop fix that so that it's going to display the right way in the URL. In this case, I wouldn't have to have encode URL component because product is just a single word. There's nothing fancy about it. But it's important that you have that, especially if we had a space in it or anything else that makes it complex. I think it's just a good habit to get into to automatically encode URL component everything. And so I'm putting that inside of parentheses. I've got product, and then I've got my ampersand again. Product is the name of the field. So I put the name of the field to encode that. If we look at that example, that's what's displaying here is this prefill product that I'm saying is equal to, that's in quotes again, got my ampersand. And now I'm encoding the URL component and saying the value is CRM. So remember this, the values are coming from here. I could put ERP if I wanted to. I could put map if I wanted to, to be able to indicate that product value. This can always be a little bit confusing because there's a lot of text there. I really would recommend copying and pasting it for the very first time and then starting to tweak it based off of your own values. That's how I started the very first time I did this. I think almost anybody who's done this can say, I started from copying and pasting somebody else's formula field here to construct it. And what that does is that it constructs our URL that's necessary to pre-fill this on our behalf. If we click this form, now that automatically pre-filled that value for me. 
to CRM. We can automatically fill in our product interest, which is really helpful. Now we can do this to any number of other fields, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a moment with multiple fields, but that's the idea behind it. Now, here's what's really interesting, and this is kind of the next advanced concept with this, is that what if we wanted to be kind of sneaky? Think of this from a marketing automation standpoint. What if we don't want the user to know the product that we're saying that they're interested in is in CRM? So imagine you've got your marketing website and people visit a page, and from that page, you know, it's about CRM. And so we want to send this information secretly to our form so that when they fill out that form, we're still sending that information through the form, but they never even see that they're interested in that product. Well, that's where we get an example to, let me just uncover my hidden fields here. We'll call this hidden product interest. And again, this is another formula field that I use to concatenate this information. It's very similar to what we had before. And let me edit the field. So you'll notice that the structure is very, very similar. Here's my, my URL that I have, and I'm pre-filling it, and I'm saying my, my product and the value. And now what I can do is I can say, and hide, and hide, so instead of prefill underscore like we did before, we can say and hide underscore product and set that equal to the value of true. So that's by default, it's false. We're showing that field. But if we want to hide the field and still send a data, we can say true. So now if I open up this, got my first name, last name, email, phone. I don't see anything about a product. Or users just click through a link that we have on our website, fill out this contact information. Now, I should say it's still available in the URL, but how many people really spend that much time looking to see all the URL parameters that are up above? In this case, it says prefill product equals CRM and hide underscore product equals true. They're not going to see it in the UI. We're still going to be able to fill in that information. Let's go ahead and test this out. So I'll put in my name here. And I'll submit this. Great, thank you for submitting the form. And then I'm gonna go back here and it's now added a new form entry for me. And it includes that CRM. And again, without me ever seeing that in the UI on the front end. So that's how we can go ahead and have pre-filled values and be able to have hidden pre-filled values. Now we're gonna talk about how we can go ahead and update a record with a form entry. For this example, we're going to pretend that we're a business and we have a large number of contacts and we need those contacts to keep their contact information up to date. So my goal is to be able to send out a link to a form to every contact every six months, every year to get them to self-update their own information. So with that use case, now we're talking about forms to be able to update records which is not something that they do just automatically. So we're going to learn the trick to be able to do that. But in order to do this, I'm actually still in the same basis before, but I've made a couple of tweaks. I still have my contact updates. This is what stores the form submissions. We have that table, which we used before. I took off the product information. And then I also have my contacts table. Now, this is like our core record, our source of truth about the contact information of our customers. We could use an account record or something very similar. But the idea here is that we want to be able to use the same fields so that if we make updates, if a user makes updates to their fields and submits the form, that it's going to update those corresponding fields in the actual customer or contact record here. On our contact updates, we have our first name, last name, email, and phone. On our contact record here, we have our first name, last name, email, and phone. And then I've got a couple other extra fields that we'll talk about in just a moment. If I'm back on my contact updates, there's one additional field here, and this is our contact ID. And to do this, I added a field, and I did link to another record, and I linked it to the contacts. Again, I'm on the one that tracks the form submissions, and I'm linking to that core contacts table. And that's what I'm calling the contact ID. 
Now, if we take a look at this in the form itself, update contact info, I've got that contact ID, first name, last name, email, and phone. Now, if I were to open this up to see what the user would see, this would be a pretty bad experience if we let them choose because they would be able to see a table of all of our contacts. And we don't want to expose that to our customers of, hey, we're just going to give out everybody's customer contact information. We don't want the user to self-select. Instead, we'll get it to automatically pre-fill the unique identifier of their contact record. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. If I come back into my tables, that's how we are set up. We've got that contact ID showing. That's our additional field over here. Again, that's the link to the contacts table. If I'm back on my contacts table, here is now the table in which we're going to create those additional formula fields. I've got a more simple example, and we'll do this one first. So I've got this called update info. And in here, if I edit my field, it's going to feel similar to our previous example, where we have the form ID. So Airtable.com slash the form ID. Again, that question mark is very important. We need that. And we're going to pre-fill our contact ID. So again, that contact ID is, is over here, our contact ID. And we want to be able to pre-fill that. And we're going to pre-fill it to the, this exact record ID. This is the core Dan Lehman contact record. And we wanna be able to take the ID that's behind the scenes and we wanna populate that in there. What happens is we don't have to type some long, crazy ID for this record. In fact, just to show you what that ID is, if I pop open my record here, you'll notice that we have this unique record ID. Sorry, let me highlight it here. It starts with REC. So every contact record has its own unique identifier. And we don't want to have to copy that and paste it in or type that in. We want it to populate that dynamically. And so if we are editing this field, and again, all of this formula information can be copied and pasted from that blog article that we have linked, but we're saying set that equal to record ID. And this is something that Airtable has to make it really easy. So all you have to do is start typing record ID and you can click on it. Ta-da, so we've got our contact ID, set it equal to record ID. I have to finish encoding that. And then we're also going to hide that contact ID. So if you remember from the previous section where we were talking about hiding things on the form, because we don't want that contact ID to show up and have them get confused and start selecting other customers' contact identifiers. We're going to hide that and set it equal to true. So that means if I now pop open this record, I don't see that contact ID anywhere. Of course, it's still hidden there behind the scenes because we're pre-filling that contact ID to send it what the ID of the record is, and we're hiding that from the form. So imagine this is the link. I could copy and paste it into an email and send it to the customer. I could have a marketing automation tool use it. I could create an automation inside of Airtable to send this out with this specific link to send it to that customer. But this link that it sends is going to be tied to that specific customer. If I had another contact record in here, its link would appear different because it would have its own record ID. So that's one important piece is to make sure that each customer gets their own version of this form. Let's go ahead and test it out. Let's say, you know, in this case, this is my contact information, Dan Lehman, and my phone number is what I want to change. So I get this email from this company and I say, you know what, my phone number has changed. I need to update that. And so I'll put in my name, email address, and now I'm changing this phone number to say my phone number is now updated. And I will submit it. Let's see what happens. Now, if I go back to where that form submission lives in that contact updates table, this is what's really cool. I filled out my form submission. It's got my name, Dan Lehman, my email address, my new phone number. And notice that because we pre-filled the contact ID, automatically linked it over 
to this contact record. So we didn't have to do anything other fancy, didn't leave it up to the user. So this is the first step behind the scenes. But if you haven't set up this other piece, it won't have done anything. It won't have actually updated this. Now I've got an automation running that did actually update the phone number. So if I expand this record, notice that this automation ran and my phone number before was 701-555-0000. And now it's updated that. So it did exactly what we wanted it to do, which is to say the contact updated their contact information. It knew which record to assign it to. And then boom, it automatically updated their contact information, their phone number. Let's talk about how to set up that automation behind the scenes to do the heavy lifting. We've got an automation event here. Again, similar to last time, we're running it when a form is submitted and we have to choose the table. This is the contact updates or the form submissions table. And we're using the update contact info form. And so we can choose a record to be able to test that out. But next we go to our update record step. And our goal is to update the contact record. So we have to do it on the contacts table, not on the contact submissions table. And this is where we're saying the record ID. So the record ID of the contact, we should set it equal to that contact ID. And then from the contact ID, we can say, hey, we want to make sure that it's set to the ID. So this is saying, if we go back over, that this value that's here, which again is that rec, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that long ID that it is, we want to take that ID and search all of these contacts to find which one matches, and that's the record that we want to update. So if I come back into my automations here, this is the record ID. That's the most important piece. And then any of these fields you can just map over. So these are fields that are on the contact table. And then I'm saying populate it with the first name from the form submission. Populate it with the last name from the form submission. So you can use any fields that you want it to have it update. The most important part is making sure that it knows the correct identifier to be able to update that record. And that's really all you have to do. This might be a video that you've rewatched a couple times just to get those steps into place or go through the examples that we have in the blog article, whichever is easiest for you. But that's gonna make it so that you can actually update records instead of just creating new records for it. Now, if you wanted to, you could have it delete their original form submission record, but I usually like to keep a historical record of it so that it's there. But again, we're able to see that historical context that that automation updated that record and when did that occur. Now I did do one more example here, which just extends this a little bit. This is a new formula field because here's where I think we can go the extra mile. Remember when we opened up this record to make an update? This is kind of annoying if you're telling a customer, hey, go ahead and update your contact information, but you don't even know my first name or my last name or my email. That leaves kind of a sour taste in my mouth. I don't want to waste my time updating all of this contact information all over again. So what if we pre-fill more of that data? So I've taken this example, and again, it's, it's a little bit longer, but all of these are pieces that we've already talked about in examples here, which is to say, we're going to pre-fill the first name. We're going to pre-fill the last name and set it equal to the value of last name. We're going to pre-fill the email and set it equal to the value of the email. So now if I were to send this, link. Notice that the URL is quite a bit longer up top, but look at how much of a better user experience this. So if I send this to a customer, now it's got their name already populated, their email, their phone number. And so now if I want to make a change and I say, oh, the phone number you have on file is incorrect, that makes so much more sense than having just a blank screen. So when I submit it, it follows the exact same process as before, creates a new form submission event. And then if we head back over to the contacts table, it's already updated that for us because it followed the same automation path. So that's one thing I do is as much as I can pre-fill to make the user experience better for the customer, you absolutely want to go that route. Okay, so from here, 
I found a really good comment from a viewer of another video who said, hey, I like this idea of pre-filling things, but I don't want to have a unique URL every single time for every single customer that I have. In her example, she was a teacher and she wanted to update all this stuff, but she didn't want to like individually send out emails with unique links to each person. She wanted to just send out one link to everybody to be able to make updates. So in this next example, I'm going to talk about how can we do this that relies less on pre-filling, but still has the opportunity to be able to update information. We're going to go exactly with what that teacher's requirements were. And so I've got a student contacts table here. And notice that I've got, this is my core record again. My core record is students. And then I have student updates, which is for my form submissions. And in my student's record, I have three students. They have a student ID, first name, last name, and their email address. Now, in order to use this example, you have to have some kind of unique identifier. It could be a student ID. It could be an email address. But somehow it has to uniquely represent just that individual. It can't represent two different individuals. And so what we can do here is have a student updates form. And with this form, let me open this up and fill it out. With this form, we're actually asking the student for their student ID because we're going to rely on that ID rather than the record ID and the link that we built. We're going to rely on that to then update that record. So in this case, students don't typically share their student IDs. So that's not an issue for us. Let me go back to my students table and we'll use my example. My student ID is 000123. And let's say I want to go by Dan instead of Daniel. I'm going to change my first name here. 000123. And I'll put in my name of Dan instead of Daniel. And then I will put in my email address. And when I submit this, let's check out my grid view here. And we've got my form submission event. And so when I come back to my student records, my name has now been updated to Dan, which I can see is because of this automation that ran. Before I look at the automation, again, remember this does not rely this time on that contact ID and then creating a special formula field. There's no formula fields that are needed as part of this. Instead, we're relying entirely on an automation. We're going off of a form submission event when that student info updates is updated. First, we need to find the correct record. And this is what's different than before. We don't know the unique identifier and we need to find that. So what we're saying is we need to search for the student. So we're going by the students table. And then we're looking based on a condition to say where the student ID is equal to the student ID, which I know is kind of confusing. But the student ID, this is from our students table. So when the student ID from the student table is equal to the student ID that came from the form submission record. So because I typed in 000123, it found that record based off of 000123, and it found that right record. And now we go to update the record, and we're updating the record from the students table. And now we're saying, hey, remember that previous step where we found the records? Now go ahead and find the actual Airtable record ID. So this helped us find the right record by using a different attribute by looking at the student ID, or you could use an email address. And we're saying, try to find the record based on that. Now that you found the right record, let's grab the Airtable record ID to update that record. And once we update that record, now we can say update the first name, last name, email, again, any attributes of that record that you're looking for. So this is a different approach here. Again, remember the last example, we created this whole complex formula field to say, hey, customer, you need to click on this specific link because it pre-filled their information. In this example with the students, we don't have to have any unique URL for them. They can all go to the same 
form. I could post that on my teacher website to say, here's your student update form. And then they just have to know a unique identifier, like their student ID or an email address to then be able to send that information and have our automation run. And now for our last complex example, your brain is probably spinning a little bit at this point, uh, but that's okay. We just wanna make sure that you get an understanding of how all of these pieces can work. And the, the last example that I've heard from a lot of folks is, how do I have a single form submission event, but have it go and create two separate records rather than just a single record? And that's what we're going to answer with this use case. So I've gone over this a little bit in another video that I have on building a sales CRM. So if you wanna watch that video, we've got the link here. And from here, the use case is, I have a submission form on a website. They're putting in their contact information and we want it to create both an account record for their organization. And we also want it to be able to create a contact record for that individual person. Got a contact submissions table. Again, very simple. We've got a name, an email address, how can we help? Um, and those are the primary fields that we ask from that user. Name, email address, how can we help? Very, very simple. Again, add more fields if you need them. But what I'm doing is I created kind of an interesting way to be able to understand the email domain that they're coming from. So when you get an email address, assuming that this is a business business use case, they have a, a personalized email domain. So we're using Elon Musk at tesla.com. We want to be able to identify the tesla.com as their email domain. So I have a formula here. And again, this is one that you can copy, but essentially we're saying, let's find just the part of this that occurs after the at symbol. That's what this formula is doing to identify this email domain. And then from here, if we go to our accounts, again, these are our master records here. We have a whole bunch of accounts and I could populate all of these, but I have it populated for apple.com. They have an email domain and tesla.com. So these are already here. Now, let's say that someone new is going to contact us from a new company that we haven't done business with before. So I'll pop open this contact form and I will just use my name and my email, which is again, automationhelpers.com. So when this comes through, if we've done this correctly, it should separate out the Dan or the team from the automationhelpers.com and that'll be the new email domain. So let me go ahead and submit my form. Thank you for submitting the form. And let's come back here. It's now created a new form submission record, Dan Lehman, team at automationhelpers.com. That formula field did exactly what we needed. It identified just the automationhelpers.com. So let's go into our automations. And I'm not gonna show you the full automation because we have some additional logic to be able to say, well, if the account does exist in the system, let's associate a new contact record. There's more complexity here that you can see in that other video that we created. But essentially what we're doing is similar to our previous example, where we're going to first find account records based on the email domain. We're saying search for records in the accounts table with a condition where the email domain is equal to this email domain from the form submission record. Again, it's saying in the accounts, does this value equal this value? Is there a record that we can find that already exists inside of the system? And that's what it's looking for. And then we're also doing the same thing for a contact record. Is there already a contact record who has this email address? If so, we don't probably have to create a new record for it. And so this is our main step here, which is to say, if it comes back and it can't find any record with the same email domain, then that means there is no matching account record for it. And if that's the case, then we want to create a new account record and we're going to use our account name here, which is the other formula field that we had. And we're going to have it with the email domain and now associate that. And that's very little information. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still gonna take someone to go 
look up on Google information about that account, but all we want to do is create that account record and then create the contact record and associate the two. So then the next step I have is also create the contact record. We create a new contact record and we say the name and the email address, and then we're saying associate it to that account from the last step. So we actually take the Airtable record ID of the account that we just created and we link the two. This might be a little bit complex and I'm happy to go into this uh, deeper if that would be helpful for folks, but mostly I just want to focus on the logic that helps get us to that point. So if I go back to the data side of it and that contact submission record, again, we didn't have anybody with this email domain before, so it created a new account record. What do you know? Automation helpers. And it doesn't know their LinkedIn and their website and all these other things, right? Because eventually we would have to look up that information or use some BI service to look it up, but it still created it. So it created our account record and it created a new contact record as Dan Lehman and it associated those two. So I can also look on my contacts I should be able to find, yep, here's Dan Lehman from Automation Helpers. It's got my email address and it's got the associated account record for it. Everything else can be filled in, do some research and legwork. But this is an example of how we can take a single form submission record. And instead of just having that form submission, we can now create those two separate records and associate them together. I hope this has been helpful for you. I know there's a lot of information in this video, everything from starting off with a form for the first time to handling some of these really complex situations. But I hope this is helpful for you as you're trying to see what is possible with Airtable Forms. If you have questions about Airtable Forms, what's feasible, what's not feasible, do I need to use a third party to be able to accomplish this? Please let us know in the comments below. Thanks.